Hey everyone, it's John Wecroft here with another Sunday Q&A. This week we're up to number 47 and the piece that I'm going to play to begin is Charlie Parker's Ornithology. I always like to go into these, uh, into these tunes with something of a plan, trying to think of a theme, of a way of approaching them. And my theme for this uh, piece today is going to be spontaneity. I'm really just going to go for it. I'm going to hopefully get it down first take and just see what comes out. Sometimes it's really nice to have a very specific idea in mind, you know, to think, what am I going to play here? I've kind of uh, some ideas mapped out. Other times, it's also quite nice to just see how the chips fall. So that's what we're going to do here, and hopefully it's going to work out okay. Uh, see you on the other side of the chain with some great questions. There's three principal topics this week. I'm going to look at an extension of the pentatonic ideas over 251s. I'm also going to look a little bit into the connection between some of the material we've looked at in these Q&As and what I do as a contributor for guitar magazines, specifically guitar techniques. And then the third idea, I'm going to give you a checklist of things that you might want to look at when approaching learning a new tune. So I hope you enjoy the piece and I'll see you in a moment with the questions. <laughs> request from Andy to revisit the pentatonic material we looked at last week and to expand upon it a little if that was possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, we took some 251 ideas last week, I'm going to expand this now to include the 6 chord. So our progression is going to be a 1, 6, 2, 5. The choices here in the key of D, I'll play D major, in this case that was D major 9. Then I'm going to play a B7 flat 9, which looks like a diminished chord, but really it's a 7 flat 9 chord, 6 chord. And then E minor to A7 sharp 5. Okay, so to begin with, let's define our pentatonic options. So the easy ones are the D major for which I'm going to play D major pentatonic. Okay, and E 
minor, where I'm going to play E minor pentatonic. Okay, so that's uh, the two and the one figured out, so that might be the first thing to look at is make sure you're okay with D major pentatonic and an E minor pentatonic for the E minor. Okay, now, last time we looked at an option for A7, so you might want to review that, but uh, let's play through it one more time. So we were coming from the A altered scale, chose a pentatonic that went one, raise nine, major third, raise five, flat seven. That was the choice from last week. I can't remember what key we did it in. We might have done it in D as well. And don't forget, of course, we've got the option of playing that here. So last week we had E minor, A altered, D major. So that's where we were at last time, and I think we also did it here. E minor, A altered, D major. So that's where we were at last time. So seeing these things is like. Uh, almost like a form of arpeggio rather than as a pentatonic scale, uh, a five note arpeggio where all five notes are in the same octave. So with this in mind, that's a clue to what we're gonna play over our B7. Our, our, so we've got D major, B7, which we'll play B7 flat nine. Okay, now B7 flat nine arpeggio would generally be this. Root, three, five, flat seven, flat nine. That kind of sound, okay. Which has got uh, uh, a connection to the diminished seventh arpeggio, of course, with root. And these next four notes create a diminished seventh sound. In fact, that's why we have this connection between the dominant seventh flat nine and the diminished seventh. Okay, now if I create a form of pentatonic with that sound, and I put the flat nine in next to the root, I've now got a five note structure. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Which can be configured two notes per string. allows us to then play the same kind of pentatonic sequences and phrases that you would play with major and minor, but now over 7 flat 9. Double stops and whatnot. Okay, now, what I'd like to do though, however, and this is where knowing this in a, a bunch of different fingerings, being a uh, flexible enough to refinger it in different positions. Rather than play the D here, and the B here, I'm gonna reconfigure the B so that it's in the same fretboard location as the D. So now it's gonna be here. So my finger is gonna be A and B, C and D sharp. Okay, so that's a bit of a stretch. F sharp to A, but it's now a pentatonic 7 flat 9, and then, which is, always look for those parallels, we covered that a few weeks ago, where we looked at how the same patterns map out into different areas of the fretboard, so you can see what you can play here, an exact copy albeit displaced when you cross the B string. So now we have D, B7 flat nine, E minor, A7 altered. Hope that's making
making sense. So we have, I'll play on the bottom uh, strings. So maybe we'll do this now in two different ways. We can see the whole shape, D. B7. E minor. A7 altered. But that's too big to be of much use to us when it's moving at speed. Whereas if I break it down into small pieces, so say for example we see the top four strings, D, B7, E minor, A altered, or the bottom four strings, D, B7, E minor, A altered. Making sense? So breaking it down into small pieces. Or we could do with two strings at a time. D, B7, E minor, A7, then the middle two, bass two, and so on. Okay, whilst we're at it, I want you to reposition the exact same information so that you can play D here, okay? Now our B7 altered, our B7 flat nine, forgive me, is... So it's a similar kind of shape. Again, what we had here, so from this B, of course we've got a B here, haven't we? So Our shape here, E minor, A7, okay so I'm hoping that makes sense and that's a continuation from our pentatonic 2.5s to fit over the 1.6.2.5. I had a request from Adam asking if I could talk a little bit about the process or processes that you go through when learning a new piece. So what I've decided to do is kind of formalize it a little bit by giving you a checklist of things to tick off when learning new repertoire. So there's gonna be a yes or no answer for a lot of these things. Some of them are, are, are quite broad, some of them are very refined. So in my typical style of uh, no expense bird, uh, high technology, here's our tune checklist, of which there's actually two. And I'm sure that uh, I could come up with another dozen or so ideas here, but let me outline some of the steps that I go through when learning a new piece. Before I do this though, I'd like to shout out a big thanks to Andy McKenzie. It was a real help to me at a really formative stage of my development with jazz. Uh, Andy knows lots and lots of pieces. He knows probably more pieces than any guitar player that I know. Uh, and I remember asking him at one stage how he went about doing that. And uh, his answer was that each week he would pick a new standard or a new tune that he was playing. And that would be the kind of, uh, if you like, the theme for his practice. So if he was going to practice arpeggios, he practiced the arpeggios that go with that piece. If he was going to practice chord melody, practices chord melody for that piece. If he's going to practice playing in 3-4, he's going to play that piece in 3-4. If he's going to practice playing bebop lines, it's going to be what bebop lines work with that tune and so on. So the beauty of this, of course, is that his practice has got a real world emphasis. Everything that he's practicing has actually got a home. It's got somewhere to live. As opposed to what I was doing a lot of at the time was just sort of amassing bits of technique, uh, amassing some tools, but not necessarily sure where they were going to live. So I'd learn a whole bunch of, uh, you know, bop lines or I'd learn a bunch of two, five, one uh, ideas, but not necessarily align them with a specific tune or a particular uh, setting so consequently you end up with a lot of information that's just sort of floating around with no home no place for it to live so with this in mind if you approach things from a, a repertoire based perspective then everything that you practice and everything that you learn is going to be applicable hopefully sooner rather than later so i'm just going to go through quickly some of the things on my checklist or checklists and let's see uh, if you can do them if you put this into whatever your chosen tune is of the week. 
So the first thing on here is melody. So of course, naturally, we need to know the melody. So if you were learning to play any particular piece, say for argument's sake, you were pretty new to jazz and you were learning a tune like Autumn Leaves, we need to make absolutely certain that we know the tune. What is the melody? And that we're clear what the melody is. Now that could be in a very kind of uh, unadorned way, not necessarily with lots of embellishments. And of course, it could also be decorated with lots of like licks and lines and things that we can do to embellish melodies to be played with expression and so on. So melody is a big topic, but it's definitely something that we need to check off. Are you secure with the melody? Do you know exactly what it is? Could you um, sing it away from the guitar? Could you uh, outline what the notes are? Do you know what degree it starts on? Could you put it into a different key? So on. So we'll get into some of the uh, the transformational things as we go. But the melody is definitely high on my checklist. The second thing is, are you secure with the harmony? Do you know what the chord sequence is? Are you really clear with that? I find that I need to uh, sometimes step away from the guitar to check how secure I am with the harmony. If I can't write the harmony down, if I can't write the chord progression down to a piece without my guitar in my hand, then I've got more work to do. I always find that the areas where I'm less certain when playing, if, if I'm trying to write a chord progression down and I'm questioning what comes next, that's not gonna get any easier just because I've got a guitar in my hand. So, so practicing that away from the instruments is a good thing to do. Also understanding uh, like an analysis of the harmony is useful. So knowing for argument's sake that ornithology starts on G major and then it goes to a two, five, one from the same root. So it goes G major, G minor, C7, F major, and then it goes F minor, B flat seven, E flat major. That's helpful in every way, you know, in terms of um, understanding theoretically what's going on, but then also being able to anticipate what that's gonna sound like when we play. So knowing the chords is definitely an important part. And for a lot of us, we just really concentrate on those two areas. And that's what we think if we know a tune, we know the melody and we know the harmony and we think we're done, you know. But there's so much else we could look at that will expand our knowledge of a tune. So the next one is, can you play a bass line? Could you play a bass line on the guitar? Now that's really helpful because that's a good way to be able to imagine the changes because you can sing a bass line. You can't sing chords, but you can definitely sing a bass line. So being able to, uh, to know how the bass line connects, even if it's just a really simple bass line, say it's a swing type tune and you can go between a two feel and a four feel, that's gonna give you a kind of an inside, really inside the harmony, an inside approach to the mechanics of how a tune is harmonically constructed if you can sing a bass line. So I find that's a really important thing. And you don't necessarily need to do this on a bass. You can play this on guitar, no problems as well. So. Okay, so then the next thing is having some improvisational strategy. So figuring out what might you do over a given tune. And of course, that's gonna vary depending upon the landscape of the piece that you're playing over. So if it's something like a modal tune, if you're learning, uh, I don't know, say you're learning one of those Herbie Hancock uh, songs, you know, that, that's based around uh, three or four chords, like Cantaloupe Island, say, or Maiden Voyage, that's a different improvisational strategy than if you were trying to play Giant Steps. You're gonna maybe adopt different approaches and you're gonna have a list there. That might be a long list. And hopefully some of the things we've done in the previous 40 plus weeks of this Q&A might give you some information that we can put into this improvisational strategy. But you could consciously, explicitly write that down and go, okay, what have you got? You know, what kind of things can you play over a given tune? Have you got a pentatonic way of playing through it? Have you got an arpeggio based way of playing through it? Do you have um, like bebop type line, minorization, Pat Martino style way of playing through it? Could you go through this um, in a way where you're playing chromaticism through the tune? Could you go through it in a way where you're superimposing major arpeggios against everything? You know, whatever you've got, could you play triad pairs? Any of the things that we've done goes into the improvisational strategy and that's part of learning a tune. Okay, bass line and melody combined, that's a really, really great thing to do because by doing this, what that's doing is it's acknowledging uh, the relationship between the melodic material and the bass line. So for argument's sake, if you learn a tune like all, all the things you are, we realize and appreciate that much of the melodic material is based on thirds. 
Okay. So then that gives you the op opportunity to change that. What would all the things you are sound like if the melody note was based on sevenths rather than thirds? It's going to give you a counter melody, which is something that we're going to come up with in a moment. So we can kind of, by acknowledging what the bass and melody, how the two things relate to one another, that also gives us some options for things like reharmonizing or for creating a new melody, maybe even creating a contrafact, which we'll get to in a moment. So that's a good thing on the checklist of things to acknowledge is how does the bass line and the melody connect to one another? Now, if it's too fast, if it's like Ornithology or Donna Lee, then what you might want, wish to do then is just pick specific points where the melody collides. So like if it's a stream of 16th notes, you might think, okay, what point does the melody resolve and to which degree does it resolve? That's a useful thing to know. Okay, so of course, some chord voicing options is something that should be on the checklist. So knowing what your options are, can you play this using drop two voicings? Can you play it on the bottom four strings? You know, with uh, the distance uh, between the low E string and the G string, those kind of voicings that you might wish to play with the range of a 10th. Can you play it um, in each of the different caged areas if you're into that kind of thing as well? So can you play through the progression around the third fret? How comfortable are you with the fifth? Say it was at the eighth, so you had to play it at the 10th fret. Now that's really useful if you're in a scenario where you're playing with another guitar player or another um, harmony player, piano player, say, because then you can kind of dance around where their preferences are. If, they, if you find that they're the type of player that likes to play high voicings on the top four strings, a la Wes Montgomery, you can stay out of the way and then play on the bottom four strings, more like uh, uh, like Django Reinhardt, Gypsy Jazz type voicings, or the kind of things that you see Freddie Green play. You can kind of, you've got some options available to you. So chord voicing options is definitely something that you could look at within any tune. Okay. Then the next thing is, can you map out all the arpeggios? You could argue that this arpeggios and guide tones, thirds and sevenths, um, but there are more, there are other guide tones. That's kind of could be related to improvisational strategy, but it's such an important thing that even just as a, an exercise, it could even be linked into bass lines as well, of course, because arpeggios are very often used to create walking bass lines. Okay, so being able to arpeggiate the harmony of a given piece is definitely something that should be on your checklist and it could be something that you could practice. Each one of these things could be a completely independent practice session, which is one of the ways that guys like Andy could spend all week on one tune because he's doing it from each of these different angles. Okay, so I wish through a couple of these other things uh, a little quicker. Uh, transposition, well, that's kind of an obvious one. Uh, now, don't fall into the trap of becoming kind of seduced by eye reel because because you can press a button and it will move it from A flat to D flat or what have you. Sometimes it's a bit like we use that to do the calculations. It's really useful for you to transpose any piece that you play just into one other key. You don't necessarily need to do it through all 12. It's a bit like if you understand the process and you understand the construction of a piece by putting it just into any other key means when you go back to putting it in the original key, you'll have a much better understanding of the kind of the geography of the piece and the construction of things like the modulations. You know, if you know the you know a tune like Cherokee, when it goes to the bridge, you know, it's a two five one starting off the minor third, say. If you're aware of that kind of thing, then because you put it into a new key, when you go back to playing it in B flat, I guess, which is what most people play that tune, right, you'll be way better prepared for that modulation because you have basically cracked the code. That's essentially what that's about. But if, particularly if you're interested in playing with singers and you play with a range of male and female singers, then transposition is going to be something you're going to get used to a lot. As a general rule of thumb, the difference is usually somewhere in the region of a fourth or a fifth. You find a lot of real book tunes are written with male keys, either instrumental or male vocal keys in mind. So it's not uncommon to have to move up a fourth. And that's usually a good place to kind of, uh, if you just wanted to have a stab, at, you know, stab, a stab in the dark, throwing something up a fourth isn't such a bad idea. Um, and it's a good thing to practice. And it also means that you'll be able to do everything else much easier, okay? Then rhythm feels and different styles, I guess that's fairly self-explanatory. 
but certain tunes, um, particularly if there's not one specific version, certain tunes are very, uh, shall we say, um, very open to interpretation. You can play Stella by Starlight as a ballad, if you like. You can play it as a mid-tempo swinger. You can play it up-tempo. You can even play it like uh, a funky version of it, if you like. You can kind of do so many different things with that. Um, just by changing the tempo, by changing just the feel, you could do a bossa nova version of it, you could do whatever you want, you know. And it's a good thing to try those kind of things out. Of course, uh, precedents have been set, which is why it's so useful if you're learning a piece, say it's a standard, to just bang the name of the tune into Spotify or have a little poke around on YouTube and see what everyone else has done with it. Uh, and then that might give you some inspiration of either A, what to do with your version, or B, what to avoid because everyone else has already done it uh, and then also to know what to expect what do people often do with a particular piece so that you're ready for it if it gets called at a jam session say and you know okay well i might expect that when people play this song you know they often go between a swing feel and a more latin feel in the b section or what have you um things like that let me hold this up to the camera just to make sure that you can get a good shot of this so there's our first checklist Melody, harmony, bassline, improvisational strategy, bassline and melody combined, chord voicings, arpeggios, and then chord melody ideas. So can you play chord melody? Transposition and rhythm feels and styles. Yeah, chord melody, I'm hoping that's fairly self-explanatory uh, as well. Of course, that's going to be based around the type of tune that you're playing. So if it's something that's a bit too rapid, you know, you're probably not going to play a completely reharmonized version of Ornithology, I wouldn't have thought, with a different chord for every melody note. So that's going to depend upon the type of piece. You certainly could introduce some chord options, though, into those bop heads. It's just a question of picking which notes are going to be um, harmonized, if that makes sense. Okay, so on to the second checklist now. This is another 10 ideas, so I wanted to give you 20 in total. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. So the first thing that's on our second checklist, as you can see there, is words. If it's a vocal tune, if it's a vocal piece, do you know what it's about? So whilst it's a great idea to actually know the words, because uh, it might inspire your treatment of a piece, if you know what the, uh, the sentiment of it is, you definitely need to know the subject or the mood. So even if you don't go to the trouble of learning all the lyrics, to know what the subject or the mood is, is definitely going to be an influence upon the stylistic setting. It's really helpful to know the words, however, particularly if you do work with singers, because then that even helps for things like form. So you, if you know that there's a first time variation ending and a second time variation ending, the, the trigger for that might be the lyrics that, are, that have been sung at that particular point. So if you know the words, you'll know your place. So I think it's a useful thing. If there are vocal versions, figure out what it's about. What's the song about? Okay, time signature options is our second thing. So meaning if you've learned a piece in 4-4, four, four, how would it sound if you played it in five? Is it something that would even work? Is it possible to make the melody work in three? Is it possible to make it work in seven? Uh, what would it feel like with a 6-8 feel or 12-8 feel, depending upon the tune, of course. Now, it's gonna be based around, some of that's based around precedence as well, i.e certain songs you kind of come to expect that they're going to be played in different time signatures because they've been played so many times so for example all the things you are it happens all the time on jam sessions it's like let's play all the things you are great and then someone from the back of the bandstand shouts out in five you know and you're in and you've got to be able to do that uh, or else you know you you might um you might have trouble you know in those kind of scenarios so some of it as well is about keeping your eyes open and seeing what kind of tunes that happens with and then being ready for it when it happens. So the deal with some of this stuff is uh, everybody kind of gets a pass the first time, meaning if you, you don't know what to expect, then it's completely fine to not be prepared. But then if it happens a second time, it's your responsibility to be, to be prepared. I always find that if I play with new musicians and then they ask to play a certain tune and I don't know it, my response is always, I don't know that tune, but next time we play again, I'll know it. And then when I play with them again, I make a point of going, well, you called this song last time and you like that tune, let's do it. You know, So I've put the time and effort in 
And that usually goes down pretty well, you know, and vice versa. I know if I play with musicians in the certain repertoire that I like to play and I call it, and if a bass player doesn't know it, that's completely fine, you know, but I might say to him, you know, if you learn that piece and I'll, I'll learn one of yours, you learn one of mine, and then we're each expanding our vocabulary and expanding our repertoire. And it's also just good manners, I guess. So anyway, so I digress. So chord reharmonization is the next thing that's on the list. So that might even be down to different versions. If you listen to a piece like Ornithology, like what I played before, um, different players harmonize the chord sequence in different ways. Now, of course, it's helpful if we all see this from the same perspective, take a tune like Georgia on my mind. I've never known two players play it the same. You know, so it's often helpful if you, uh, you're in a more arranged scenario for someone to have notated their particular uh, arrangement, to have your own lead sheet. So that in that instance, we can say, okay, for the purposes of this performance, we're all playing the same harmonization. But it's good to know what your options are. So you can reharmonize this as an arrangement idea, but also just to be prepared for the different types of harmonization that you might hear in a, a playing situation. Just be aware of what the options are. And sometimes it's nice to have a conversation beforehand and say, which changes are you going to play? You know, So sometimes you find uh, certain real books and whatever, they, they'll often lean on the chord changes that Miles Davis might play, even of tunes that he didn't write. So if you look in most real books uh, for a tune like Straight Note Chaser, uh, it'll be an F, right? That's because Miles played it in F. Uh, Thelonious Monk plays it in B flat. And he wrote the tune, you know, but the common consensus is to play it in F. So, so knowing what the options are. Okay, some counter melody ideas. That's a really nice thing to do, to invent a counter melody. And this was, will tie in um, First off, you could play a counter melody as a kind of harmony thing or as a form of counterpoint. But then also it could lead on to something we're going to see in a moment. The idea of creating a contrafact. Contrafact, which is a whole new melody, a whole new composition based upon an existing structure like Ornithology. Ornithology is How High the Moon. Um, and so many of those Charlie Parker tunes are based upon the chord progression from something else that he's written a new melody for. So that's a contrafact. And you see that all over the place in jazz. Okay, have you traded options together? So this is a good thing to practice. Can you play through a tune and trade fours with yourself? Can you play rhythm for the first four and then drop in and solo over the next four, and then rhythm and then so on? Or do that in eights or do it in, depending upon the structure, if it's a blues, do it in twelves or do it in sixteens, whatever it might be. Some pieces, they don't, uh, they don't line up because there's extra bars here or there, you know, so all the things you are is a good case in point. So which is 36 bar form. So if you're trading fours, it's going to flip each time. So there's that thing of what do you do? Do you give the drummer the last eight so that it goes back to the top and so on? But know what your options are. It's part of knowing the piece. It's as much part of knowing the piece, knowing the number of bars in the structure as it is knowing the melody. Okay. So contrafact options. That might mean when you're playing ornithology, you might quote the melody from How High the Moon. That's a common thing. And you often find that... Uh, you'll hear players doing that, you know, quoting a different melody from one of the other options, rhythm changes. There's gazillions of tunes based on rhythm changes. Okay. So the next one, arrange a suitable intro or outro. Remarkable that that's often overlooked when learning tunes, like set it up. Can we set the tune up? Now is the tune or, the, or your uh, intro or outro going to be something that reflects what's happening in the piece or is it going to be something completely unique? Is it going to be a, a, a different section? Like a lot of these standards, there are other sections to these pieces. When you hear Tony Bennett often singing some, some standards, you, you might hear this unexpected section at the start, and that's actually the verse which nobody plays. So sometimes doing a bit of research and figuring out are there any missing sections that have generally speaking been dropped off when the, they've been inserted in things like real books. So it definitely raises the question then of don't become too reliant upon real books because very often they're based upon one version of a tune and there's room for interpretation, there's room for debate as to whether they're, they're accurate. So listen to as many different versions as you can, preferably, uh, preferably by the original composer if you can, then you're gonna get a good indication of the intent of what the actual intention is. Okay, so then the last two 
kind of a bit uh, broad, you know, a range of tempo. So can you play this tune really slow, super slow? Can you play it roasting fast? It's good to be um, to be ready for almost anything because sometimes, particularly if you play with saxophone players, they like to play tunes really quickly. Um, and I find what I have a tendency to do is if I'm playing and I'm in control, it's my band, then I choose tempos that I'm comfortable with. But then when I'm playing and I'm just a guitar player, I have to deal with tempos that other players might like to play. And sometimes that might not be in my comfort zone. So it's very, very useful to practice your pieces at those edges. So figure out at what stage does it start getting too quick to be comfortable? And that's where we should be doing some practice. Likewise, Reduced tempo, slow tempos are often more difficult than fast tempos because there's more space and there's more margin for error. So working on things to a range of tempos is definitely a wise idea. And the final thing, play what you hear. So all of this said and done, once we've done all this study, what do you hear on that tune? Can you rehearse it walking down the street just singing the parts in your head? If you can do that, we're in, we're in. We're definitely playing what we hear. Now there is that thing about you have to put the information in to begin to hear it. So first off you might be playing things that are outside the realm of your hearing. Playing certain scalar options that you don't necessarily imagine but you know they're the right scales. You put the information in so that then when we imagine the tune, so doing a bit of practice away from your instrument, singing a solo over a particular piece, you know that's something that I do quite a lot of. You know when I'm creating these backing tracks, so can I sing a solo over ornithology and the solo that I sing and the solo that I play, how close are they? And they should ideally be the same thing. So the last thing, play what you hear. I had a question from Roz asking about the connection between some of the material that we've covered in these Q and A's, plus the things that I do uh, for Guitar Techniques magazine. I've written for Guitar Techniques now since about 2004 or five, I think. Um, I started and it was GT 108, I think, and we're up to GT 320 something, 323 or something like that. So that's way over 200 editions and I've pretty much written for all of them. I think bar, I think five or six um, over that period of time. Obviously there was a period where I wasn't playing, uh, which is about a year ago now actually. It's coming up to a year since COVID nearly got me. Um, so there's a few months there that, that, I, that I missed out and um, and other than that I think there's, it's been pretty much continual um, and then also some months I do more than one article I do a cover feature plus the regular monthly thing and then I've written for a bunch of other guitar magazines as well uh, some stuff's been in Guitar World Guitar Part in France uh, Total Guitar and Guitarist Magazine as well which is up from the same publishing um how's the same stable as it were as guitar techniques uh, and it's absolutely brilliant it's it's such a fun thing to do um, I'm a fan of those magazines particularly guitar techniques I'm a fan of that magazine anyway irrespective of me being actually in it and I've done a range of different things uh, some of which of artist based you know like kind of in the style of and whilst I enjoy them they're great because I, I get to learn an awful lot you know and essentially it, when I did a lot of that kind of stuff, I'd do nothing but listen to that artist for weeks, you know, and then try and figure out what it is that makes them unique and focus in on those factors, which is really useful because it gets you to, uh, to really understand style and then also understand the essence of kind of creating your own style as well, trying to find things that are unique to you. Um, and it doesn't need to be that much. You know, most players, most of what they do is, shall we say, public domain but they might have one or two little idiosyncratic ways of approaching certain things, which is really inspiring when it comes to putting your own style together where you realize that it's fine to know what everyone else does, but just have your own spin on a few things and you're gonna sound like you. But anyway, I digress. So the stylistic ones were fun, but the ones that I find the most enjoyable are kind of like the ones that I'm doing at the moment, which are based around a specific approach, device, whatever it might be, particular idea. So, for example, the one that I've recently completed this week, uh, I recorded it only yesterday actually, was based around the kind of things that you hear players like Oz Noy play, uh, where he racks up 
a variety of different dominance options over the one, four, five, but does it all in the same area. Now, that's something that is very useful for every player, irrespective of whether or not you know you want to sound like Osnoy. That's not the important thing. It's about dealing with the devices, dealing with the, uh, the tools, so to speak. So I guess the question is, how much connection is there? And, and to be fair, a lot, I would think, based upon the, the fact that I'm given pretty f much free reign in terms of the content. Um, myself, in, in uh, conversation with Jason Sidwell, who's the music editor, uh, we come up with these topics together. But in terms of the actual what goes on in the um, in each article, I think they trust me now that it's going to be cohesive and that it's going to uh, it's going to function both educationally and then also it's going to make sense in print. That's definitely something about uh, trying to get ideas across verbally in a you know, or in a printed format is different to. Uh, trying to express ideas like as we are now um, where you can actually physically see me play or in person where if something doesn't go across you can reserve and you can try and say the same thing lots of different ways I find the idea of trying to get, a, get it across in text is really good in terms of clarity it means you've got to be clear and you've basically got to be really specific about what you're trying to say and I think that's an important part of our practice if you know what it is that you're trying to do then when you're actually practicing you can establish whether or not you're doing it. Where sometimes I think we pick up the guitar and it's just aimless. We just play and we're not entirely sure what we're trying to do. And if we're not entirely sure what we're trying to do, how do we know when we've got it? You know. Uh, and whilst sometimes happy accidents can happen just because you've got the instrument in your hands and just sort of flailing around at random can be quite good fun, uh, I've found it's usually helpful if you've got a plan. So if you've got a specific thing in mind. So just by way of illustrating this, I'll show you a little bit about what's going to be in, in the coming months. It'll be out in maybe two or three months. Uh, this concept of looking at one area of the neck, so say we say around the eighth fret. So what Oz might do is he might choose, say, minor pentatonic and put it around the one, four, five. So he might go C7, raise nine, F7, raise nine, G7, raise nine, G7, raise nine. And around that, we've got C minor pentatonic. F and then G C and then we can practice going between those three sounds in that one area so what's helpful here is instead of seeing a scale or an idea everywhere on the neck it's about seeing it in detail in one location so can I play C minor can I play F minor G minor, back to C. That's going to allow us to make these transitions, rather like uh, the one six two five idea we just looked at. It's got to be in the same area of the neck, and it's all well and good knowing it everywhere, uh, or knowing one thing everywhere on the neck, and that's a different topic, and that's another equally important thing. But it's also good seeing how these things change, so that you can effectively see in this instance all three sounds at once. Okay, so we can do that with minor pentatonic. We could do it with major pentatonic. And here you might choose a different chord. You might choose a six chord, say. So C6, F6, G6, C6. And then I might play C major. Then I might play F major. Then G major. Can you change between them? In one area, so that's major pentatonic, again, in one area. Then we can expand upon that and go C7, F7, drop two voices in this case, G7, back to C7. So can we play C uh, Mixolydian? Mixolydian, G Mixolydian, so 
again, same deal. So all in the one area. So you can see that because we've got that in one area, making the transition from one sound to the next is much more achievable. Then we can start getting into the more exotic scales now, Lydian flat seven. F Lydian flat seven. Hope this is making sense, yeah. Uh, and then of course, same thing there. You can see this from the melodic minor perspective if you wish, you could say that this C, uh, Lydian flat seven. minor and uh, F Lydian flat 7 is F is C melodic minor and the G Lydian flat 7 is D melodic minor so on okay and again phrase for each one would be cool then we can get into the symmetrical diminished sound now this has this peculiarity where you actually move the scale up and down in semitones because it moves in minor thirds so meaning if I play half whole diminished from C, when I want to play from F, that's essentially the same scale as B because it replicates in minor thirds and flat fives. So B to F is a flat five. So meaning C half whole works against C. F half whole is the same as B, so you just move down by a semitone. And believe it or not, if I want to play for G, I just move down another semitone. Or we go, in this case, from where we began, I can choose to keep going. So IE, I'll go C, F, and that's going to be G. Or I could go C, F, C, G. That's an option to go up a semitone. So any kind of phrase you've got, G. You know, those kind of ideas leaping around. Okay, so then the next scale choice that uh, that we chose or that I chose in this article, I think was whole tone scale, and that's uh, maybe whole tone came first. Yeah, so that's got this peculiarity of there's C whole tone, and here's F whole tone, and here's G whole tone. It's the same thing yeah? because, of course, C whole tone scale. If I move that up or down by a semitone, that's going to give me this, the whole tone scale for F. And F and G are the same because there's only two whole tone scales. It's like odds and evens. So by that, what I mean is if I play C whole tone, it's like going C, T, E, all the even frets. 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Whereas F whole tone is one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, and so that's the same as G. So that means any phrase that's the one to the four. It's also one to five as well. Okay, that kind of thing. And then the final scale choice I think was the altered scale, which guys like Oz Noy uh, interestingly play over static one chords, and it's pretty out there. But you know, to quote Oz, you know, he said that's the idea. You know, that is the idea. So when you use this over a non-functioning five chord, it can sound quite tense, but it's a cool sound nonetheless. And if it's played with intent, it's gonna sound cool. It's like a sidestep type sound. It's like playing melodic minor with semitone higher, if that makes sense. So again, same deal. We would have C altered. Uh, so C altered could be this chord, and there's the scale. And then we have F altered, and that could be like G altered, that with that one. Then back to C altered. Like so. So, this concept of being able to move between the one, the four, and the five in one area, of course, I'm doing it here. We should be able to do this in lots of other locations. It might be a good place to start to consider limiting ourselves, like we did with the two, five, one ideas, to root on the E and root on the A, and then go outward from there. If you've got the root on the E and the root on the A, 
locations covered, then that's a great place to begin and then we can worry about expanding from there. So that's the kind of things that I do in guitar magazines. And I've maintained from day one and probably will maintain until the end that the person that learns the most from putting them together is me. It's the process of putting it together. I find not only uh, I'm hoping that I can share some information, but it cements it so much better in my own mind. It's one of the reasons why I do these Q and A's. You know, it's a, it's a great way for me to stay on top of my own skills. So I'm not completely, uh, you know, without self, as it were. You know, I'm aware of the fact that me putting these things together is a great way for me to like stay on top of these skills, particularly whilst there's not being so many gigs. Now, hopefully the gigs are gonna resume. And with that in mind, I'm hoping that I'm gonna still be in relative shape, you know, as a player. Whereas I think if I hadn't have put these things together, maybe practice would have slipped, in which case then I'd have a lot of ground to catch up when gigs begin. And there we have it for week number 47. I hope you found that useful and informative. I'd like to thank you for getting this far in and for all the great questions. Feel free to send me any requests for the remaining few weeks. Uh, yeah, we haven't got that long left now. So get your requests in. If there's any particular topics that you'd like me to cover or any pieces you'd like me to play, then please feel free to just uh, shout out, uh, comment below, or you can contact me. I'm pretty easy to get hold of. Uh, so I'm hoping that you're staying inspired. Next week, I'm going to have to try and fit in um, a few sessions throughout the week as I've got a gig on Sunday, which is great. Gigs are starting again. Lockdown is being eased. So let's, fingers crossed, let's hope that we're stepping in the right direction. And um, yeah, I'm going to be playing next Sunday, which is amazing with real musicians and a real audience as opposed to a virtual thing online. So wish me luck. And uh, I will see you next week with week number 48.